thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we can go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Commodore classroom hosted by the Vanderbilt Association of Hispanic and Latinx alumni and the Washington DC alumni chapter. My name is Teresa Temkin and I'm the president of the Vanderbilt Association of Hispanic and Latinx alumni as well as the president of the Washington DC chapter. I'm joined here tonight by Katherine Hooper and Carolina Johnston of the Vanderbilt Alumni Relations Department. To start, I'd like to say a few words about the Vanderbilt Association of Hispanic and Latinx alumni or VALA. VALA is an acronym for our new alumni association, which was founded in the fall of 2019. It is a group of all uh, of members of the Vanderbilt Hispanic and Latinx community and is led by Vanderbilt alumni and supported by Vanderbilt staff. We aim to be as inclusive as possible with members of our community, and that is why our name includes both Hispanic and Latinx. Um, and pays homage to our diverse alumni who belong to many distinct Hispanic and Latin cultures from around the world. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to um, mention a few events. Uh, thank you again for joining us in this most unusual fashion. We're very excited to have uh, Professor Lopez joining us tonight as we have this event on when we were Spanish, Latinx culture and identity and literature. Um, we aim to continue to have these Commodore classrooms virtually in 2021. For those of you who are on the Eastern Seaboard, we also will be having a holiday party next week. So do please make sure um, on 17th on Thursday. So do please make sure that you sign up for that via VU Connect. Um, that way you can get a list of the ingredients that you need to make some of the uh, uh, foods that were some of the cocktails that we're making during the event um, as a way that we are going to gather and socialize uh, in a little bit of a different light this way. On January 12th, we will be having a virtual fitness event and lecture um, from Vanderbilt's alumni, Dr. Jordan Nutzel, who is a New York physician and best-selling author. And then I hope you all saw that on Monday, um, one of Vanderbilt's research um, professors who has been instrumental in the development of the Moderna vaccine will be giving a uh, chat as well. So do please make sure to sign up for that. Um, additionally, at the end of the event today, we'll be taking um, questions. So please make sure to populate your questions throughout the event into there and we will moderate them uh, at the end of the event. And then we will also be doing a quick survey at the end, so please do stick around for that. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Professor Lorena Lopez. Um, Professor Lopez is the Gertrude Conway Chair of English and directs the Creative Writing MFA program and is the faculty director and co-founder of the Latino and Latina Studies Department at Vanderbilt. She's the author of seven books of fiction, and is the editor or co-editor of three essay collections. Her first uh, book, Soy la Avalon Lady and Other Stories, won the integral Miguel Milano Prize for Fiction. Um, Professor Lopez's short story collection, Homicide Survivors Picnic and Other Stories, was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Prize in Fiction in 2019, in 20, sorry, 2020, and the uh, winner of the Texas League of Writers Award for Outstanding Fiction. And her most recent uh, publication is a collection of short stories titled Postcards from Gertrude State Stories, which was released by MK, uh, sorry, MBMK Press in October 2019. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Professor Lopez so that we can enjoy this evening's conversation. Thank you again for joining us, Professor. Thank you, Teresa, for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. And thank you to everyone who's taken the time to be here. I'm going to present a personal essay and overview of Latinx literature titled When We Were Spanish. We are Spanish, my mother would tell my sisters, my brother and me. She was a woman of prodigious bluntness 
nearly a menace with the truth. But on the rare occasions when she told lies, they were whoppers. And this was one of these. We are not Mexican, she would say, before pointing out that our family had never even been to Mexico until my cousins ventured across the border to purchase recreational drugs in the late 1960s. This was largely true. My mother's family claimed to trace its presence in central New Mexico from the 1600s. She was descended from Sephardic Jews who immigrated during the Inquisition and then strangely converted to Roman Catholicism. My father's forebearers migrated from Mexico in the early 1800s. Both families, though, resided in territory that was part of Mexico until 1848, when the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed. To my knowledge, our ancestors never transgressed the U.S.-Mexico border. Instead, in the words of the actor portraying the Latinx busboy in the film Bobby, the border crossed us. To complicate matters, my parents relocated from just outside of Albuquerque, where most people shared similar cultural heritage, to Los Angeles after my father had trouble finding work in post-World War II New Mexico. In LA, oh, I think the, the slides got a little jumbled. Um, in LA, this is slide three. <clears throat> His vet, so that would be the previous slide. Um, in LA, his veteran status earned him a civil service job with the Department of Water and Power, where he worked for over 40 years. I grew up in the now gentrified, but then working class Echo Park District, slide four, among Mexicanos, Cubanos, Puerto Ricanos, Dominicanos, Central and South Americans, Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and African Americans. And of course, a smattering of people of non-specific European heritage. But really, the majority of white people we encountered appeared on TV and movie screens. In Southern California, we met even fewer people like us, or as my mother would insist, Spanish. <clears throat> All Latinx people share some Latin American heritage. Apart from this, there is no essential or singular trait of cultural identity. Nonetheless, in the United States, those who are Latinx or Hispanic are often viewed as members of a monolithic and homogenous group. As proven by the recent election, this is an impossibly narrow categorization, an imaginary space for filing diverse individuals into a single slot for easy comprehension. Many Latinx people are likewise complicit in promoting such fiction in order to create the illusion of solidarity and unanimity that promises national political power. From this oversimplified notion of cultural identity, Latinx writers often emerge as mediators, translators, or insider ethnographers bearing artifacts from the native culture to inform and entertain members of the dominant group. Some writers support the idea of cultural cohesion, despite variations contradicting the sameness that makes feasible a spokesperson. Other Latinx authors and literary theorists resist essentializing myths of cultural identity, while somehow clinging to the notion that a clearly recognizable Latinx experience can be presented through literature. The preeminent Chicana author and theorist, the late Gloria Ansaldúa, is best known for contesting reductive cultural definitions. In Borderlands, La Frontera, the new Mestiza, Ansaldúa states, quote, I, a Mestiza, must continually walk out of one culture and into another because I am in all cultures at the same time, end quote. She portrays her experience as what critic Ivan Yavro Vejarano terms, quote, a constantly shifting process of breaking down binary dualisms, end quote. Don Saldua's objective is to dismantle paradigms in decolonizing the self. Her writing nonetheless evokes comparatives that reinforce cultural essentialism with allusions, with allusions to the Chicano people being indigenous like corn and similar to Chile Colorado. And despite efforts of many Latinx authors to resist conflation with Latin American authors, with its corollary expectation to produce magical realism, Ansaldúa further claims that US Latinos and Latin Americans share a common culture. 
in an essay titled um, Finding a Latino Voice, Dominican American author Julia Alvarez likewise asserts an inherent cultural bond between herself and William Carlos Williams, a poet born of a Puerto Rican mother and North American father. In Democracy and Literature, Cuban American writer Pablo Medina critiques Alvarez's claim to this deep unconscious ethnic connection as sentimentality, as kitsch. Medina contends that William Carlos Williams is as quintessentially and unhyphenatedly American as Walt Whitman. <clears throat> Further stating that Williams is a poet whose work transcends nationality and ethnicity and affects us on a human level. By such reasoning, writing that particularizes cultural experience is incapable of moving beyond its categorization. Medina further argues against the tyranny of the adjective or our national predilection for labeling people. He complains that, quote, too many critics and editors tend to rely on labels because they make easier what is essentially a very difficult task, the evaluation of literature, end quote. To exemplify this, Medina recalls sending his novel to an editor who declined to review it due to the difficulty of finding someone to critique that kind of book. Without knowing anything about the book beyond the fact that an author named Medina had written it. While Medina decries the constraints of cultural labeling and its impact on literary production and promotion, essayist Richard Rodriguez rejects the term Latino itself, questioning its preferred political correctness. In fact, Rodriguez writes, quote, Latino commits Latin American to Iberian memory as surely as does Hispanic. To call oneself Hispanic is to admit a relationship to Latin America in English. So Hispanic is a brown assertion, end quote. Conversely, author Sandra Cisneros has reportedly turned on her heel to stride out of bookstores with sections labeled Hispanic. Cisneros says, the term makes my skin crawl. It's a very colonistic term, a disrespectful term, a term imposed on us without asking what we wanted to call ourselves. As the word was coined for census purposes by the Nixon administration, many believe that the dominant culture affixed this label as a means of circumventing the empowerment claimed by a cultural group through the act of naming itself, as occurred with the Black Power Movement. Here, I must note that the term Hispanic is often used by more conservative members of this cultural group or by those unaware of how identifying as Hispanic suggests alignment with the conquerors rather than the conquered. But using Latino or Latina proves problematic, <clears throat> proves a problematic substitute due to the perceived gender bias in the Spanish language, wherein collective nouns for mixed gender groups are masculinized, erasing for some the female presence. The term Latinx was introduced to sidestep that quagmire. Such considerations complicate even the simple fact of referring to ourselves as a group. And as Pablo, Med Pablo Medina observes, it raises the question of whether we should be called anything at all. Contestation testifies to the diversity within this cultural group, even among those similarly engaged in generating literature. The sampling of conflicted positions noted here compels this question. How can we treat Latinx literature, literary production as a definable corpus while allowing for multiple and shifting identities and perspectives along with the ongoing transformation of Latinx culture. This query catalyzed a project that Blas Falconer and I embarked on years ago in gathering essays for a collection titled The Other Latino, Writing Against a Singular Identity. While we sought to present literary works by Latinx writers as a recognizable opus in which varied pieces are linked by shared experiences specific to culture, we also aimed to defy limitations that categorization imposes on creative work and to refute stereotypes concerning cultural identity. The stereotype forecloses on empathic imagination and as logical fallacy, generalization urges us to ignore empirical evidence, data gathered daily from our own nuanced lives. 
And this allows us to deny such uniqueness in others. In this way, assumptions related to culture divest us of individuality, compromising the humanity of those who are targeted by and those who subscribe to such beliefs. My own lived experience easily contradicts cultural assumptions. My mother, for example, failed to match the demographic profile of the Mexican maternal figure presented to me in teacher training. Instead of being that self-effacing, nearly invisible, but deeply revered Madre Mia in the background, my mother stood nearly six feet tall. She was outspoken, opinionated, and annoyingly omnipresent. She loved public speaking. In elementary school, I rarely attended an assembly without facing my mother on stage, though she was not yet a teacher at the time, but an officer in the PTA often addressing students and faculty with her big booming voice. By the time I was an adolescent, she taught at the parochial school I attended. Only in high school did I escape her public presence, though she appeared on campus anytime a meeting involving parents occurred. She spoke Spanish and English, both at top volume. And despite her views on her heritage, she was diplomatic enough not to offend Mexicans and Mexican Americans comprising the majority in the audiences she addressed. My father, though wisely silent in my mother's presence, was at least as verbose, if significantly less opinionated than she was. Largely untouched by machismo, he had an infinite capacity to be laid back. Very little faced him. But when we were growing up, he occasionally reminded us of one line we should never cross. If you ever dye your hair blonde, then that's it, he, he would say. You can't live in this house anymore. In the context of his laissez-faire parenting style, the subtext issued with crystalline character, uh, clarity. We should not mask our ethnicity. I could derive a more global prohibition from this, something related to denying the self, but given my father's reluctance to set too many parameters, that would be going too far. My father's warning, singular as it was, stayed with me, formulating into an idea on constructs of reality and being. There were real people, people like us, whose parents and relatives spoke Spanish, people who ate enchiladas, sopapillas, and caldos, people with warm, lilting voices, people who emitted the fragrance of masa, roasted chile, and crushed cilantro, and then there were the not so real people who sometimes had blonde or red hair and fair skin who spoke flat, unaccented English. People who smelled slightly soapy, slightly sour to me. This simple construction of self and other morphed into a confluence of revulsion and pity toward playmates not fortunate enough to have been born with dark hair or to families with Spanish surnames. I remember one friend, Arlene, a sturdy blonde who visited my house one afternoon and asked if she could use my hairbrush. I hesitated, but relented, allowing her to stroke those amber waves with my brush. After she went home, I stared long and hard at the bristles, the pale strands like filaments, like metallic filaments trapped in them. I quailed at the prospect of removing these by hand or even with the teeth of my not touched by blonde hair comb so I ended up throwing it away. Growing up in the age of television, I rarely encountered representations that informed my concept of, of cultural identity in a helpful way. I am old enough to remember the Frito Bandito, Speedy Gonzalez, and a host of slumbering sombrero-wearing Mexicans and Westerns who were about as significant as cacti to the gunslinging white hero. In the good, the bad, and the ugly, the Mexican, well, not bad, was ugly which to me was worse than being bad. And he was played by Eli Wallach, a doof. On television, the white people, those I construed to be not so real, made choices and took actions. They had surnames, slight, they had surnames like Anderson, Reed, and Cleaver. And though they had few family members, they occupied large houses with well-manicured lawns on streets unlike any in our neighborhood. As a child, I struggled to watch them living their amusing and privileged lives without wanting to be at least a little less real. 
This contributed to a confusing state of affairs for me, especially in adolescence when I, when I embarked on the ontological journey to define the self. Who was I, I wondered, and what was I? Satisfying answers to such questions came more easily for my older sister, who identified with our Mexican-American schoolmates and neighbors. Somos Chicanos. She took to the language, the customs, and especially the left-leaning politics with ease, completely eliding our more complicated New Mexican roots. By the definition I now apply in determining Latinx identity, Latin American heritage, inculcation in US experience, and self-identification as Latinx, she was perfectly right to do this, to self-declare as a Chicana. Her assessment was, in fact, more accurate than my mother's insistence that we were Spanish. After all, the early Spaniards, the conquistadores and refugees from the Inquisition were usually men. Ancestral survival entailed reproduction. Reproduction meant miscegenation somewhere along the line. And in fact, we now know that our paternal grandfather was born of relations between a Hispano man and a Navajo woman. Knowledge now substantiated by DNA testing that indicates an even greater level of Native American ancestry in my maternal haplogroup. Though unaffiliated with present day Mexico, we are certainly of mixed blood or mestizos from which the word Mexican derives. Nevertheless, my sister's fundamental logic and easy assimilation into this cultural context proved more difficult to me, for me, Everywhere I looked, the not so real people appeared to be in charge and telling the real people what to do, including my father's supervisors at the DWP and the principal, a French Canadian nun at the school where my mother taught. As I grew into adolescence, my simple categories began to tumble and rearrange. Those whom I initially believed to be real seemed more and more compromised in authority and resources, while those I once deemed to be not so real had it all. Accented speech, appearance, racial markers like height, skin color, and hair color, and last names unfurled certain delimiting narratives that cut off opportunities to forge identity and create the self as an individual and as a sentient being. The impulse to define and neatly categorize cultural experience not only influences how we are perceived and how we think about ourselves, it also shapes literary production and the way it is interpreted. Categorization further determines what material is available to readers in conjunction to what is acceptable and appealing to publishers. The publishing industry with its 3% Hispanic workforce presents yet another hostile borderland. Latinx authors must confront in making their individual stories known. The controversy that erupted with the publication of American Dirt by Janine Cummins displays a pitfall in entrusting cultural production to those driven by commercial gain, but disinclined to expend the effort to go beyond stereotypic representations manufactured by authors outside of the cultural groups they inscribe. Authors like Cummins with the audacity to claim the intention of, quote, giving a face to the faceless brown masses, end quote. Still, the large presses decide which books to publish and promote. And in this way, corporations determine what stories get told and by whom. In her essay, Island of Bones, author Joy Castro writes, anthologies don't mention us. By us, she refers to Cubans who migrate, immigrated to the US before the so-called first wave in, the in 1959, the lower classes, economic refugees, as opposed to professional and upper class political exiles, whose experiences and, and conservative politics seem to dominate and define Cuban American narratives. Anthologies also tend to exclude apolitical authors like Teresa Duval Page, who grew up in post-revolutionary Cuba and moved to the United States when she was 30. By writing books in both Spanish and English, he straddles two cultural groups as a Latin American and as a Latinx writer. Poet and memoirist Judith Ortiz Cofer similarly describes her experiences of exclusion and consequent feelings of shame for being unable to write and speak fluently in Spanish. She recalls her panicked response 
when asked to give a speech in her native language. A Puerto Rican who will not give a talk in her native language, que vergüenza, Ortiz Crawford mourns forfeiture of her mother tongue as a signifier of the lost realm of childhood and familial intimacy, a closed door that cracks open now and again, never to swing wide for her the way it once did. Arguably, apart from connection to Latin American culture, no trait signals Latinx identity more in mainstream consciousness than the Spanish language. The immigrant experience, though, is a close runner up, despite the fact that the vast majority of Mexican Americans comprising the largest Latinx demographic by outnumbering all other groups combined and doubled are native born US citizens. Some of whom, like my mother's family, descend from early settlers who ventured into what is now the mainland United States before Jamestown was established. A fact that inclines me to respond to nativist rhetoric demanding newcomers return to their country of origin in this way. After you, my dear. Nonetheless, the assumption that Latinx identity means recent immigration prevails. A review of my novel, The Gifted Gabalon Sisters, a book that spans a century and a half in the lives of native Hispanos and indigenous Hopi and Pueblo characters living in the US. That is a century and a half of characters living in the US. This review bizarrely credits me for, quote, yet another take on the immigrant experience, end quote. As literary anthologies are organized by common experiences such as immigration, these texts, while striving to reflect diversity in American literature, instead exclude authors whose writing does not fit into parameters identified by editors. Furthermore, if educators at all levels are unfamiliar with Latinx literature, they're likely to reach for what is widely available, gravitating toward familiar themes or well-known authors in selecting texts. In all cases, the idea of that kind of book referenced by Pablo Medina speaks to the notion that texts by prominent authors perform an implausible synecdoche in which the anomalously successful part represents the whole of Latinx literature, engendering in educators the belief that they have done due diligence to this great and sprawling corpus of cultural production by covering work by a few famous authors. To challenge false notions of singular and essentialized cultural identity and to expand existing scholarship on Latinx literature, we must consider writers whose work diverges from the expected cultural narratives and examine how their unique perspectives shape content and form in their work. This means including Latinx writers of all races, all levels of social class, all variations of sexual orientation and all national heritage. And it entails consideration beyond charmingly harmless tales that deploy the usual signifiers, the wise abuela, the chaotic barrio, ubiquitous helpings of rice and beans and inconsequential sprinklings of Spanish added like exotic spice to make a dish more ethnic. And altogether, wait, for each, each Latinx author in telling his or her unique story debunks assumptions about Latinidad, and altogether they reflect the richness and range of this literature, thereby dismantling the idea of that kind of story. An insultingly limited perspective on a rapidly expanding and a diverse cultural group and its literary production. As a college student in the 1970s, I couldn't help but pick up on this limited viewpoint, noting its exclusionary practices in the American literature courses I took, where no reading by Latinx authors was assigned. Imagine sitting in classrooms where your national literature is studied and never encountering as much as a passage that recognizes your cultural presence. Where did we go, I wondered. How were we among the first European arrivals to this continent banished before reaching the pages of syllabi tucked into my binder? This created a hollowness in me, a feeling that transcended erasure, 
by suggesting my ancestors, those who not only forged my connection to this nation, but built the nation itself, had never existed at all. Years later, I would be astonished to learn that Spain was the first country to introduce a written European language into what would become mainland US, the mainland US, beginning in 1513 with Ponce de Leon's diaries of travel in Florida. Many scholars now recognize that Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca's 1542 memoir, La Relacion, or the account as the first book of American literature, predating publication of John Smith's first diary by 66 years. This was followed by a written culture that issued the first descriptions of the new world. All of the institutions of literacy, schools, libraries, archives, courts, and more were introduced to North America in the mid 16th century by Spanish immigrants and their descendants. By 1834, Spanish language printing presses operated in both California and New Mexico, issuing approximately 2,500 periodicals up until mid 20th century. Such journals conveyed news and information related to commerce and politics, as well as poetry, serialized novels and stories, essays and commentary from local writers and highly regarded authors. Yet, by the time I was a college student, that well-established and vibrant literary tradition was largely ignored by English language focused scholars and educators. And from then until now, the unavailability of material and lack of attention invested in studying Hispanic texts as American literature create the false impression that such writing is new and foreign, intrinsically connected to the immigrant experience, traits that also define members of Latinx culture in a way that is similarly limited and inaccurate. Early on, I decided I did not want to be defined in this limited way, and I had no desire to lose opportunities because of this. Moreover, with my height, fair skin, and accentless speech, I found that I could pass. And so I tried to do this, to be real and not so real, whichever was which and whenever it suited me. One can likely guess how that worked. In my Chicana life, I partook of social events with my more outgoing sister, working hard at not being called out for my lamentable Spanish and lack of nostalgia for Mexico. That was fine, but as I grew older, I found the male-female dynamic in these contexts appalling. Machismo disgusted me. In college, I transformed from a Cosmo girl into a regular reader of Ms. Magazine, launching myself via consciousness raising into a, as a feminist and discovering Gloria Steinem, Adrian Rich, and Betty Friedan along the way. Nothing in my experience of the world convinced me that one sex was entitled to dominate another. No male I encountered exhibited judgment I deemed worthy of preempting my own. That unfortunate illusion would come later. And I lacked the skill and patience for feigning admiration for the opposite sex. So while it suited my sister to sit ardently listening to her Chicano boyfriend play guitar with his bandmates, practicing the same mind-numbing chords for hours on end, this drove me to contemplate mass murder. When we both attended Cal California State University Northridge, or CSUN, my sister urged me to join Movimiento Estudantil Chicano de Atlan, called Mecha for short. A student activist group on campus convincing me to attend a meeting with her. During the session, one male leader after another addressed the group, and I remember thinking that if I wanted to hear some man yammer on and on, uninterrupted and unquestioned, why well, I could just go back to attending mass. At the conclusion of the meeting, the final speaker issued this unforgettable announcement. Now, if the girls would go back to the kitchen and back, we've got stuff for you to make tostadas. Here, I rose from my seat, pushing past the tide of willing young women, marching toward the kitchen. I walked out, never to return again. My sister also persuaded me to take a Chicano studies class at CSUN. This course was taught by the brilliant Rodolfo Acuna, a man I came to admire and even emulate in the classes I now teach. Professor Rudy Acuna presented me with the full gallery of heroes, men and women, on whose backs the Chicano movement was built. 
He introduced me to Chicana feminists, including the legendary Dolores Huerta, along with Mirta Vidal, Ana Nieta Gomez, and Marta Cortera. And he did not shy away from the shameful truth about the 1969 Denver Youth Conference, wherein the male leadership determined, quote, it was the consensus of the group that the Chicana woman does not want to be liberated, end quote, sparking fierce outrage among the women present and leading to the inception of the Chicana feminist movement. Although I was too young to participate in the movement, I was thrilled to learn about these pioneering women leaders and their struggle to be recognized beyond the few obligatory lines in Corky Gonzalez's long seminal poem about Chicano identity, wherein women, when they appear, are portrayed weeping over their slain men. Despite Rudy Acuna's respect for Chicano feminists and recognition of their contributions, by the time I came along in the mid 1970s, Chicano student activists, at least at CSUN, had resumed business as usual, men in charge and ordering women into the kitchen to whip up tostadas. Had she known about this, my mother would have pointed out that this particular dish, the tostada, also known as the chalupa, and comprised of a crisp corn tortilla layered with refried beans, cheese, lettuce, and chopped tomatoes is not something we eat, much less prepare. That's Mexican food, she would have said, and we are Spanish. As a writer, I have found that the limitations imposed by cultural assumptions definitely challenge my literary production. Once in a graduate creative writing workshop, I was taken aside by the professor who informed me that my characters, though they had Spanish sounding names, struck him as just people and not really ethnic types. He lent me a book by a Chicano author to help me understand how to write in a more culturally appropriate way. Respect for this man kept me from mentioning that his work did not strike me as particularly Jewish did it not also behoove him as a Jewish author to write in a more culturally appropriate way? I could have re recommended he read Bernard Malamud or Isaac Bashevis Singer. And here again, I want it both ways. I cry racism when readers complain about my use of Spanish in my novels and point out that no one thinks less of T.S. Eliot for the Sanskrit that pops up in the wasteland as if old T.S. and I were once colleagues in the same peer writing group. Though it usually compounds my troubles, at times my cultural ambivalence has worked to my advantage, probably oftener than I know. When I moved to the South, I was hired by a covertly racist community organizer who was required to staff the federally funded agency she, she directed with diverse employees. In her eyes, someone who could pass and not pass, a woman of color who looked and sounded white made for a tolerable compromise to this mandate. So genetics paid off when I lived in Georgia and was desperate to escape the particularly perverse <clears throat> hell that is student that is substitute teaching. While I benefited from a lack of ethnic signifiers, usually this advantage triggered internal conflict, feelings of guilt, betrayal of self, and undeserved privilege, especially when opportunities such as the aforementioned job rolled my way. And once my chameleon act lost me a position just before I finished my dissertation, I applied for a creative writing fellowship at a two-year college in Phoenix, Arizona. I had already lined up an assistantship with the Georgia Review, but this one-year teaching position that came with a real salary enticed me. When invited to fly out for an interview, I accepted. At the very least, I would have the opportunity to visit it with a friend who was at the University of Arizona in nearby Tempe. Though the interview went well, I remember slogging through molten creosote in the parking lot certain I would reject the offer because of the blazing heat. Confident an offer would be made, I should have been suspicious when escorted to meet ESOL faculty for a discussion of pedagogy related to teaching English to non-native speakers. Within a week, I had a call from the college in Phoenix. The chair of the selection committee, a white woman, informed me they'd hired a candidate who would relate better to students. Someone more Latina, she told me before offering me another position at the college. Tenure track, the chair said, as if to tempt me with something more desirable than the 12 month fellowship and not merely tossing me a consolation prize for coming up short in the Latinidad department. 
The dean, she explained, wanted me to teach ESOL in the fall. Oh, I said, realizing that I was to be part of a twofer in which the college aimed to acquire a pair of Latinas in one hiring swoop. When I rejected the offer, the chair asked why I turned them down. I said I had another offer, but the woman persisted, wanting to know more and perhaps suspecting the boondoggle aspect to my visit on their dime. I mentioned the Georgia Review and stressed that I am a creative writer with no aptitude or desire to teach ESOL. Yet I must look like an ESOL instructor, for this is the assumption I encounter these days when people who know my last name learn that I teach Vanderbilt University, or else I am asked if I teach Spanish. Here in the South, Spanish is a polite word to use when talking about Latinx people. With immigration intermittently stirring nationalist foment, the word Mexican has devolved into a slur in my adopted home state of Tennessee, and neither Latinx nor Ticanex has worked its way into the vernacular. When I stroll into my local supermarket to find salsa, I head for the aisle labeled Spanish foods. So strong is reluctance to use the M word. And as I peruse the shelves, I often wonder what Spaniards would make of these products. A tortilla in Spain, for instance, is an omelet and nothing like the flat wheat flour or cornmeal wrapping for beans and meat. What would a Galician or a Castilian make of pickled nopales or tomatillos? In the South, where people are friendly and inquisitive, I am often questioned about my church affiliation. And when Southerners learn my last name, they often ask if I am Spanish. At times like these, I flash on an image of my mother. In it, she raises an eyebrow and bobs her head. She's nodding at me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. That was fantastic. And um, again, I'm so glad that you were able to um, put on this talk for us tonight. Uh, for those of you who um, don't know, this is again our first uh, event for the Hispanic and Latinx alumni. So again, I'm very excited that we were able to begin with you. Um, as we said, we do have a uh, question and answer segment now. So um, if you do want to start populating those questions in, we've gotten a few. And then again, uh, we do have a survey at the end for you guys to go ahead and do. And that's already been populated down into the chat. So please make sure to do that as well. Um, the first question is, is why don't we, why don't uh, folks use the term Chicano anymore? And you've used it throughout your conversation, but um, why would you say that it's not necessarily as nationalistic a term uh, in your view? Um, you mean as as nationally used? I think yeah. I think a lot of people are aiming for a pan Latina identity, mm -hmm. and so they go with Latinx. Um, and in this particular region, I think it is not as popular. But in California, it it is more popular in California, and I think in Texas. I think in those regions, it is still popular, but more and more, that is a very good question, more and more people are gravitating toward Latinx. And that is for that, for purposes of, you know, creating that large right. identity. So it's it's almost the same reason um, that, well, newcomers, the word Latinx, the word Chicano, the word Chicane, they have little meaning outside of the US. So it, it, you are instead a Peruvian or a Mexican. You are not that that thing that you become when you're in the U.S. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a good point raised here, which is Chicano primarily seem, it refers to Mexican American, and I know right. as a Cuban American, I would not necessarily use the term. And in fact, uh, mm -hmm. growing up in South Florida, I wasn't even familiar with it until I went to college. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that there's a great Toni Morrison quote, which is, uh, you know, in the United States, um, you know, everyone has to hyphenate. <laughs> uh, so I think that, that as we seek new terminology, it is that what do you identify as that is not that hyphenation yeah, yeah. of I am X American. Um, so finding that new terminology. Right, right. And, and I, I guess I, I, I should say Chicano comes from Mexicano. 
so it is only for, for for people to use it accurately is only from people with Mexican heritage. So it wouldn't be applicable for you know a Cuban American or a Puerto Rican. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for clarifying that as well. Um, and then as well, how do you feel personally about the use of the word Hispanic? Do you feel that again, like Latinx is just a more inclusive term or where do you think yeah. that if it's a trend or where do you think it's going? That's a terrific question. Um, and it is a very controversial subject. Uh, I have to say I'm with Sandra Cisneros. I, 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 I kind of, I, I understand that the, the term was developed for census purposes by the Nixon administration, and it was very cynically developed with the idea of divesting power that comes from naming yourself as a cultural group. And so for that reason, I'm, I don't use it. And it, and it, and it tells, and, and when I hear it used, it tells me one of, one of two things, which I guess cancel each other. And that is the person doesn't know that history or um, this person is probably more conservative or more, more, I guess, I guess it's everything these days is read politically and this person's probably more right leaning politically. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, whatever the reasons, I, I, don't, I don't like the idea of a term that is imposed on, on a cultural group. So that's why I would go to, to Latinx always. That would be my preferred. Turn. Absolutely. And I know that uh, we have we had a, a number of deep conversations about it as we did go to name the Vanderbilt Association of Hispanic and Latinx alumni. And it was just that it was a what do our alumni call themselves? And it was that generational conversation of depending on, you know, where you're from, what your background is, you know, what you are, that that is what makes a difference there. And and in respect for what folks are and call themselves, we want to be as inclusive of, as possible. My, my own parents would have probably used Hispanic because they're of that of that of that mindset and time, or they were they, they passed away. Um, then, insofar as some of the literature that you included, you I know that you and I first actually met, so to speak, over email when I, I sent you an email asking for for a list of books. Um, you showed so many wonderful books. Uh, what would you recommend that folks read? I know that we've put out a list that you helped provide us with, but what do you folks read to really help? You know, I know you've mentioned some anthologies here to really help educate and drive them towards some of these great authors. Well, there it, it is. It is another you know problem of I can't get the part to represent the whole. There, it uh, there are so many wonderful authors out there and they're not always going to be in the in the bright shiny hardcover books by the major presses sometimes you need to look beyond that and um i would say you know pick up a catalog from university of arizona press they have a wonderful series that you could look into um and the smaller the university presses the independent presses that's where you're going to get a lot of interesting stuff that hasn't been um predetermined marketable, but it, but it is really very interesting. Um, and it also depends, what are you interested in? Are you interested in nonfiction? I'm teaching a testimonial course this spring, and I was really astonished by how many great works of creative nonfiction and memoir there are to, to, um, to draw upon. And I found myself really attracted by books from independent university presses. So um, yeah, I would say look beyond those big five bright, fancy splash books. Um, and and um, I think supporting the independent presses is important too. There's University of um, Arizona Press, University of New Mexico Press, there's Arte Publico out of Houston. There's, there are many great small Latinx presses that will really provide a variety of unique reading options for you. 
Absolutely. And we'll push out the list that you gave us as well. And if you have any others, we're more than happy to push them out based on what you um, have here. Uh, then one uh, alumni here has asked, what labels do the university presses use? I imagine um, this is in regards to Hispanic, Latinx, um, Chicano, or um, some of the others, but are there any particular like labels or like I saw some of the anthologies said things like Latino anthology. Are there any particular like labels that we should be on the lookout for? How should we best search out some yeah. of those those anthologies? And oh, in your opinion, um, there's yeah, I, I it, it it is really hard to to say. The Latino boom, which is one that I that I displayed, is actually pretty good. I, I don't like that it has those categories in it, but it is actually pretty good. And the Elon Stavins um, anthology. There's also a Norton. Or I think the Elon Stavins is the Norton. Sorry about that. Um, there's also one out of Arte Publico. The, the title escapes me, but there's a, a pretty interesting one out of Arte Publico, an anthology of. Um, Latinx literature. Um, there, there, there are a number of, of good ones. It is hard though. I, I don't understand this predilection for creating those categories. I would, I would, I think I would prefer even a chronological arrangement of work rather than this is about immigration. This is about feeling like an, you're alienated. And I, I don't like that kind of thing as much. So thematic divisions, but, um, yeah, there are quite a few, and um, I can I can I can probably put it put it together a list if you'd like to circulate it. That would be wonderful. I think I, I think a number of our folks would really appreciate that. Um, on that same note, do you think that given both the rise of things like you know private webs or not private websites but websites and blogs as well as um, you know, the ability to self-publish, do you think that this is allowing more people to give rise to their own voice and maybe give us a broader community, especially now that, you know, I know that, is it Random House is acquiring Simon Schuster, or what have you, like the, as the publication market shrinks, do you think that that is going to help us to still continue to find some of those more unique stories um, in this market? Yeah, I, 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 I have mixed feelings about that because yes, well, there are many more voices coming out in um, unconventional ways such as blogging or self-publishing or print on demand. Um, there, there is the question of who is our audience then? We're, we're basically writing to one another and are, are we, how are these stories getting disseminated? They're, it's kind of an enclosed space and um, and and if that's and if that's what, what what the author wants, then that's what what you should do. Then that that's fine. I, I guess my problem is with with the the big presses deciding and the three percent Hispanic workforce that does not reflect the demographic of this country, not by a long shot. That is that is a real problem that needs to be addressed. So I, I guess I would be I would be more inclined to why can't we address that matter? and have access to that forum instead of having to create these other approaches that are limited in distribution. Why can't we have what, why can't the publishing industry reflect the demographic in this nation? I, I, I don't wanna step around that. I think we should confront that directly. So, so then I guess we'll, we'll end with this then. What would you say would be, is there any, best step thought that you have on a way that we can, you know, encourage or a way that you would say that that those um, publishing houses can really help diversify who is in them and making those decisions um, besides the kind of vote with your wallet sort mm -hmm. of thing. What would be your thought on that? Well, I think it, well, that the controversy that erupted with Janine Cummins book, I think that was tremendously helpful. I think that was a, a, a wake up moment for the publishing industry. And I think people were taking note. Um, I don't think we can relent in complaining about that and making known that this is not 
satisfying. And we're seeing people of color making incursions into major publishing um, and getting together, comparing advances, talking about how people of color receive different treatment by publishing houses. I think the more that we can communicate with one another and expose the inequity and keep hammering on it, um, that is how change is going to come about. I really do believe this. Uh, if we let this fade, as you know, a hiccup that that soon disappears from from our our thinking about publishing, um, we will lose that momentum. But it is a good moment right now with that controversy to to make our complaints known that we want to see the publishing industry reflect the demographics of this nation and not limit the choices that we have. They're incredibly powerful. It, the books that you see on a cash wrap in a bookstore or the ads that pop up on your screen, it's not accidental. These are, th these are publishing companies who are investing quite largely in certain titles um, and it's it, there just needs to be greater equity. There really does. Absolutely. And I hope that we will be seeing more of that. But I do think that we are making strides. So I'm very, I am very hopeful. And I want to thank you once again for joining us. Mm -hmm. And um, I do want to thank all the alumni um, and uh, family and community who joined us here this evening for our first event of the Vanderbilt Association of Hispanic and Latinx Alumni. Uh, very pleased to have you all join us here tonight. If you could please make sure to fill out the survey uh, that was dropped into the chat, we would greatly appreciate it. And do please take a look um, out for your VU Connect emails and do please join us for some more events. And we hope to see you all in person again real soon. But in the interim, look forward to joining you all virtually again throughout the rest of the year. And have a great evening, everyone, and please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.